If you have a Bible, we are going to be in 1 Samuel chapter 2, 1 Samuel chapter 2, looking at verses 12 to 36. 1 Samuel chapter 2, verses 12 to 36. If you are able, uh, please stand for the reading of God's word. Now the sons of Eli were worthless men. They did not know the Lord. The custom of the priests with the people was that when any man offered sacrifice, the priest's servant would come while the meat was boiling with a three-pronged fork in his hand. And he would thrust it into a, the pan or kettle or cauldron or pot. All that the fork brought up the priest would take for himself. This is what they did at Shiloh to all the Israelites who came there. Moreover, before the fat was burned, the priest's servant would come and say to the man who was sacrificing, Give me meat for the priest to roast, for he will not accept boiled meat from you, but only raw. And if the man said to him, Let them burn the fat first, and then take as much as you wish, he would say, No, you must give it now, and if not, I will take it. By force. Thus the sin of the young men was very great in the sight of the Lord, for the men treated the offering of the Lord with contempt. Samuel was ministering before the Lord, a boy clothed with a linen ephod, and his mother used to make for him a little robe and take it to him each year after when she went up with her husband to offer yearly sacrifice. Then Eli would bless Elkanah and his wife and say, May the Lord give you children by this woman for the petition she asked of the Lord. So then they would return to their home. Indeed, the Lord visited Hannah, and she conceived and bore three sons and two daughters, and the boy Samuel grew in the presence of the Lord. Now Eli was very old, and he kept hearing all that his sons were doing to all of Israel, and how they lay with the women who were serving at the entrance of the tent of meeting. And he said to them, Why do you do such things? For I hear of your evil dealings from all these people. No, my son, it is no good report that I hear the people of the Lord spreading abroad. If someone sins against a man, God will mediate for him. But if someone sins against the Lord, who can intercede for him? But they would not listen to the voice of their father, for it was the will of the Lord to put them to death. Now the boy Samuel continued to grow both in stature and in favor with the Lord and also with man. And there came a man of God to Eli and said to him, Thus says the Lord, did I indeed reveal myself to the house of your father when they were in Egypt subject to the house of Pharaoh? Did I choose him out of all the tribes of Israel to be my priest, to go up to my altar, to burn incense, and to wear an ephod before me? I gave to the house of your father all my offerings by fire from the people of Israel. Why then do you scorn my sacrifices and my offerings that I commanded for my dwelling and honor your sons above me by fattening yourselves on the choicest parts of every offering of my people Israel. Therefore the Lord, the God of Israel, declares, I promise that your house and the house of your father should go in and out before me forever. But now declares the Lord, far be it from me, for those who honor me I will honor, and those who despise me shall be lightly esteemed. Behold, the days are coming when I will cut off the strength and the strength of your father's house, so that there will not be an old man in your house. Then in distress you will look with envious eye on all the prosperity that shall be bestowed on Israel, and there shall not be an old man in your house forever. The only one of you whom I shall not cut off from my altar shall be spared to weep his eyes out, to grieve his heart, and all the descendants of your house shall die by the sword of men." And this shall come a pass, come upon your two sons, Hophni and Phineas, shall be a sign to you. Both of them shall die on the same day. 
And I will raise up for myself a faithful priest who shall do according to what is in my heart and in my mind. And I will build him a sure house and she, he shall go in and out before my anointed forever. And everyone who is left in your house shall come to implore him for a piece of silver or a loaf of bread and shall say, please, but put me in one of your priest's places that I may eat a morsel of bread. This is God's word, and he has written it to us for our good. You may be seated. Let me pray for us. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks and praise because you have spoken to us in your word. So we pray now that as we read and preach your word, that you would bless it that you would use it as a means of grace for our souls. And we ask that you would show us the glory of the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Now, sadly, this story of Eli's wicked sons doesn't sound too strange for many of us this evening. Eli's sons, Hophni and Phinehas, were who we are introduced to in 1 Samuel Chapter 1, verse 4, our priests who serve at the temple, or more accurately, serve at the tabernacle at Shiloh. These ordained servants of God corrupted God's worship. They stole from God's people. They bullied God's people and committed sexual immorality that was on display for all to see. It's a very heartbreaking passage of scripture, but it's not a passage of scripture that feels too unfamiliar. It reads like many of the headlines that we've seen over the last several years. Headlines such as, such as pastor accused of financial impropriety or famed apologist accused of sexual infidelity. Celebrity pastor removed for spiritual manipulation. Anglican priest found guilty of sexual abuse, reformed minister deposed for spiritual manipulation. These headlines have served as a reminder that there is no denominational structure that is sin-proof. Each of these stories or headlines is heartbreaking because there is something particularly heinous When a leader in the church of Jesus Christ disregards God and harms God's people. Now there are those both inside and outside of the church that when they hear stories like this one in the Bible or perhaps read the headlines that I just shared, who would respond by saying, see, this is why we need to do away with organized religion. It's nothing more than spiritual leaders manipulating people for profits. It's filled with individuals who simply want more power and control. And I would respond to that by saying that God places this story in his word. He spares no details in regards to the sins of his leaders, of his people, because it's meant to cause us to long for something, or better yet, someone Who is better? Every time we read a headline of a fallen pastor or Christian leader, we are to rightly grieve, but we are also to long for a better leader. We don't need to do away with the concept of of leadership. Even in our growing suspicion, we need leadership. It's a practical necessity, and at the same time, it is a deep longing in the human heart. And right there, you find the theme of 1 Samuel. In 1 Samuel, what is laid out before us is that the people of God need a king. They need leadership. And this is the longing of all of our hearts, especially when we come to texts like the one that is before us this evening. As you read this story, you see that there's a stark contrast between the sons of Eli, Hophni, and Phinehas, and the little boy Samuel, who is ministering in the temple. In Hannah's prayer that is just before this, in 1 Samuel chapter 2, we learn of this theme of reversal. 
that God will humble the exalted and he will exalt the humble. That those who are prideful will be brought down, but those who remain in a posture of humility will be raised up. And that is what is taking place in our text this evening. The priesthood of Eli, which has been corrupt by sin, is being brought to an end. And at the same time, God is exalting Samuel. And what I want us to see in this text this evening is that God has provided for us an eternal priest. And I want us to see this main point by looking at our text under two headings. The first point that I want us to see is that the humiliation of an ungodly priesthood. And then the second thing I want us to see is the exaltation of a new and better priest. So first, the the humiliation of an ungodly priesthood. And then secondly, the exaltation of a new priesthood and better priests. So first, the humiliation of an ungodly priesthood. In verse 12, we are told that the sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, we're told that they were worthless men. It is to say that these men are completely and utterly wicked. They were associated with death and destruction, with wickedness and rebellion. They, in a very simple way, were corrupt. It's ironic that we are told that these two sons of Eli are worthless men because in 1 Samuel chapter 1 verse 16, Hannah pleads with Eli to not consider her to be a worthless woman. You see, what Eli perceived Hannah to be is what his sons actually are. We are told that they are worthless men because they are priests who do not know the Lord. It is bad enough if this were to describe any Israelite, but there is something that is particularly bad about this because these are priests in Israel. They are spiritual leaders in Israel. They were responsible for leading God's people in worship. They were responsible for offering sacrifices On behalf of the people, they were to teach the people the things of God. They were called to represent God to the people and to represent the people before God. Their whole calling in life was to know God, to walk in his ways, and to help others walk in the ways of the Lord. And yet these two sons, these two priests, did not know God. The Lord. How unfortunate it is for that to be a description of the spiritual leaders in Israel. How unfortunate it is that they were so close and so well acquainted with the things of God and yet did not know him. How unfortunate it is that they were leading God's people in worship to a God that they were not in fellowship with. As a pastor, this is convicting, but I think there's a lesson for all, for all of us here, and that lesson is this, that you can do things for God. You can participate in religious ceremonies. You can be well acquainted with divine things and at the same time not be in fellowship with the Lord. You can do very religious things outwardly religious things, and yet not be in a relationship with the God of the Bible. This was the case of Hophni and Phinehas, and because they did not know the Lord, this was demonstrated about in how they went about their work as priests. We're told in verses 13 to 14 that when individuals were coming to offer sacrifices, the priests would send their servants while individuals were boiling meat and they would have this kind of this barbecue fork and they would take the meat and, and keep for themselves a large portion of the meat, likely for the sacrificial meal afterward. And now God's law did make provision for the priests to take certain portions of the meat on certain animals. We learn this from passages like Leviticus 7.34 and Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 3. This was God's way of 
providing for the priests, and and they were given these resources so that they could live. But we see that the the priests were taking more than what they were to, to be given. It is to say that God was providing for these priests, but they were not content with this. They wanted more. In a real sense, they're just plain old greedy. And this causes them to be emboldened to the point where they also want the fat portions of the meat as well, according to verse 15. The problem with this, and the priests would have known this, is that these portions, according to God's law, were reserved for the Lord. Leviticus chapter 3, verse 16 to 17, we read these words. And the priest shall burn them on the altar as food offering with a pleasing aroma. All fat is the Lord's. It shall be a statue forever throughout all your generations and in all your dwelling places that you either eat neither fat nor blood. You see, the priests were corrupting the sacrifices that belong to the Lord so that they might feel their own appetites. They take what belongs only to the Lord so that they can feed their own stomachs. It reminds me of the words of Paul in Romans chapter 16, verse 18. Paul says, for such persons do not serve our Lord Christ, but only their own appetites. Or Philippians chapter 3, verse 19, where Paul says their end is their destruction. Their God is their belly. They, they glory in their shame with minds set on earthly things. According to verse 16, on the occasion when a faithful Israelite seeks to make sure that the sacrifices are done properly and the fat is burned for the Lord, the priest would threaten to take it by force. They were bullying God's people. They wouldn't allow for right sacrifices to take place. And think about what this would have done to the consciences of a believing Israelite. You know that you've sinned against God and you're here to offer sacrifices for sin because you know that the Lord has made provision for your sin to be atoned for through the sacrificial system. You bring your your sin offering so that your sin might be atoned for. And the priest bullies you and takes the portions that belong to the Lord. And you leave not knowing if your sins are truly forgiven. How might that alter your relationship with the Lord? We're told in verse 17 that this sin of Hophni and Phinehas was very great in the sight of the Lord. For the men treated the offering of the Lord with contempt. They despised the offering of the Lord and treated it as if it was nothing. But their sin doesn't stop there. Verse 22 tells us that Eli, their father, heard reports that they were laying with the women who were serving at the entrance to the tent of meeting. The tent of meeting was the the tabernacle. It was a place where the Israelites would enter God's holy presence and there would be women who who served in this place and to ensure that everything was kept well. And we learned that these men, these priests, would have sexual relationships with these women. These women who were to be treated with the utmost respect and chastity were used to satisfy the appetites of these ungodly and wicked leaders. Beloved, these priests are nothing short of wicked men. Their behaviors in public office as ordained ministers would have negative effects on the spiritual and moral climate of God's people. Because if these men were to represent God to the people, if these individuals are not taking the things of God seriously, why would anyone else in Israel do the same? Everyone did what was right in their own eyes, largely because the priests were doing whatever was right in their own eyes. 
One writer commenting on this says, men of corrupt lives at the head of religion who are shameless in their licentiousness have a lowering effect on the moral life of the whole community. We're told that Eli, in verse 23, approaches his sons and he asks them about their sin. Verses 23 to 24 says this, and he said to them, Why do you do such things? For I hear of your evil dealings from all these people. No, my son, it is no good report that I hear the people of the Lord spreading abroad. Now, here is where Eli is at fault. He knows about his son's wicked behavior, and he has chosen to do nothing about it. Eli's son's sin is their own, but as their father and as a priest, he should have removed them from office and replaced them with godly and qualified priests. While it is commendable that Eli does have this conversation with his son concerning their sin, he does absolutely nothing to curb their wickedness. 1 Samuel chapter 3, verse 13, we read that God says to Samuel that he will punish the house of Eli forever for the iniquity that he knew because his sons were blaspheming God and he did not restrain them. In a real sense, Eli chooses to enable them. In fact, in verse 29, when God confronts Eli Through the words of a prophet, God tells Eli, you have honored your sons more than you have honored me. Why do you think Eli chose not to correct his sons? Did he fear them? Did he perhaps not want to make things awkward between them? Was he tired from a long day after work and he had no energy to correct their behavior? Whatever it is, Eli did not love his sons enough to challenge them in their sin. And I think that's instructive for us this evening. Friends, do we love our children? Do we love those closest to us? Do we love one another enough to at times with wisdom and grace and patience to, and love to challenge them when they are in sin. Now, let me make it clear. I'm not saying that we should become confrontational or we should be those who are, are fault finders. But I am saying that when we see those around us walking headlong into a path of destruction, then we should at times challenge them so that they might walk in the ways of the Lord again. This is what Paul says in Galatians chapter 6, verse 1. Brothers and sisters, if anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. This is what we're called to do together as a community, which also means that you must have a willingness to also be corrected. You see, everyone, including myself, wants community until that community challenges us. Unfortunately, Eli's words of rebuke fall on deaf ears. He warns his sons of the situation that they are placing themselves in. In verse 25, Eli says, if anyone sins against a man, God will mediate for him. But if someone sins against the Lord, who can intercede for him? Eli tells his sons that if they sin against man, that they might be able to find, they might be able to come to God for a complaint. But if they sin against God, who can they bring their complaint to? His point is that they're opening themselves up to severe judgment without the possibility of being able to escape. And then at the end of verse 25, We read these haunting words. But they would not listen to the voice of their father, for it was the will of the Lord to put them to death. 
Eli's sons ignore their father's rebuke. Why? Because it was the will of the Lord to put them to death. Eli's sons are responsible for their sin. They stole and abused and mocked the Lord by treating his sacrifices as nothing. And because of this, he hardens their hearts so that they might not hear their father's rebuke. God gave them up to the desires of their heart. He gave them over to the consequences of their sin, which is his judgment against them. It's a perfectly just judgment. You might be thinking right now, perhaps, that, wait, this sounds horrific. God hardened their hearts as an act of judgment? I don't know if I agree with that or even like that. Well, I would say that God's judgment against wicked leaders who abuse God's people should not cause us to be distressed, but it actually should provide great comfort. Imagine looking at a person in their eyes, and they have been abused, taken advantage of, spiritually manipulated, and you look them in the eyes and say, God is not going to do anything about the suffering you have endured. And friends, that's the only logical solution if you do not affirm a God who pours out his judgment upon wicked leaders. Some of the strongest words in the Bible are words of judgment that are reserved for spiritual leaders who mistreat God's people. Judgment will be poured out upon them unless they repent and take refuge in the Lord Jesus Christ. This is not only a warning for spiritual leaders, but it's also a warning For us all, Del Ralph Davis commenting on this verse says this, someone can remain so firm in his or her rebellion that God will confirm them in it so much that they will remain utterly deaf to and unmoved by any warnings of judgment or pleas for repentance. Beloved, do not harden your heart against the Lord. Don't ignore the conviction or the the nudging of his Holy Spirit. Don't continue to walk headlong into sin that only leads you to destruction. Don't ignore the gentle correction of those who are around you. You see, God's judgment not only rests on Eli's sons, but they also rest on Eli and the entirety of his household. Verses 27 to 34, we read that a prophet comes to Eli with a word from the Lord, and this prophet brings a word of judgment. He says that because of Eli and his son's unfaithfulness to the Lord, because of the rejection of God, because they did not honor the Lord, he is going to remove Eli's entire household from their role as priests. In verse 32, he says that there will not be an old man in Eli's household, that all of his descendants will die by the sword. And this will be confirmed, according to verse 34, when his sons both die on the same day. He also says that if anyone is left from Eli's household, they will be left begging for bread. A household that once got fat off of the Lord's bread due to their sin, will now be begging for bread. You see, God is declaring that he is going to bring this priesthood low. He is going to humiliate them. He is going to bring an end to this extremely corrupt priesthood, this priesthood that extended all the way back to Aaron, a priesthood that was to be perpetual, is now being brought to an end. And we'll see this, that this begins to take place in chapter 4, when Hophni and Phinehas and Eli all die. As Hannah says in chapter 2, verse 4, the bows of the mighty are broken. That that verse helps you understand the whole book of 1 Samuel, and the Lord is breaking the bows of the mighty in this text that is before us. That's the humiliation of an ungodly priesthood. But even in this hard word of judgment, we are also given a word concerning 
the grace of God in Jesus Christ. And this brings us to our second point, the exaltation of a new and better priest. Exaltation of a new and better priest. As some of you know, I'm from Louisiana, and this morning was already hard for me because we got our first taste of winter is coming. Uh, I showed up at church this morning, and everyone said it was crisp. Uh, and crisp simply, simply means to me cold. Uh, it's code word for cold. Uh, but one of the hardest parts of winter for me is the month of April, and sometimes May and sometimes July, when it continues to snow in Michigan. Uh, my home state, uh, the promised land, uh, everyone is eating crawfish while I am suffering in exile, watching it snow uh, from my front living room. Uh, but one of the things that I do appreciate about the snow in those later starting to get warmer months is that as you just kind of watch the snow fall, you begin to see different plants start to grow in spite of the snow. You see, uh, we've planted some some tulips, and you'll see the bulbs of the tulips just kind of pop through, even though there is snow all around them. And that's exactly what takes place in our text this evening. That it's a text full of judgment, a text that reminds us that God takes sin seriously, but sprinkled throughout this text are bulbs of grace. And these bulbs of grace center on a little boy named Samuel. I wonder if you've noticed as you read the text how this narrative sprinkles information concerning Samuel throughout the story. In chapter 2, verse 11, we read that the boy Samuel was ministering to the Lord in the presence of Eli the priest. In verse 18, we read Samuel was ministering before the Lord, a boy clothed with a linen ephod. Verse 21, and the boy Samuel grew in the presence of the Lord. Verse 26, now the boy Samuel continued to grow both in stature and in favor with the Lord and also with man. In chapter 3, verse 1, now the boy Samuel was ministering to the Lord in the presence of Eli. As Hophni and Phinehas, two unfaithful ministers, fall into more and more and more corruption, as they descend into more sin, as they fall under the judgment of Almighty God, there is a boy named Samuel who's ministering in the tabernacle, who is growing physically and spiritually before the Lord. You see, the headlines in Israel today may read corrupt priesthood in Israel as Hophni and Phinehas take advantage of God's people, but in the shadows where no one can see, where no one knows, God is raising up another leader for his people. Beloved, hear me. God is always at work in and for his people. Even in distressing circumstances like the text before us, God is at work quietly and faithfully, yet persistently and stubbornly raising up a new leader for his people. He's replacing Eli, Hophni, and Phinehas with a little boy named Samuel. God is raising up Samuel to be a leader amongst his people. And interestingly enough, the narrator of this text describes Samuel using priestly language. We're told in verse 18 that Samuel was clothed with a linen ephod. An ephod is a piece of garment that kind of looks like an an apron, but it is a garment that is ordinarily worn by priests. According to verse 28, God required a priest to wear an ephod before him. And again, we read that Samuel is wearing this ephod before the Lord. We're also told that Hannah, Samuel's mother, when she visited him at yearly sacrifice, she would make for him a little robe. Again, robes in the Old Testament are ordinarily worn by priests. So the narrator is intentionally giving us these descriptions of Samuel and effectively saying that here God is exalting a new and better priest, one that will replace these corrupt old priests. And this leads us to the glorious promise that we read in verse 35. Take a look at verse 35. God says to Samuel, 
I will raise up for myself a faithful priest who shall do according to what is in my heart and in my mind. And I will build him a sure house and he shall go in and out before my anointed forever. As God brings this priesthood and household of Eli to an end, God is making the promise that he will raise up for himself a faithful priest. And this priest will not be like Eli. He will not be like Hophni or Phinehas. No, he will do the will of the Lord. He will be obedient. He will offer right sacrifice. He himself will be righteous. But the question is, who is this priest that is promised? Based on the descriptions of Samuel, we might believe that he meets the standard. But we learn in chapter 3 and later in the book of Samuel is that Samuel is not a priest. Samuel is a prophet. Samuel is a, a, a judge. So he's described in priestly terms. But at the end of the day, he is not a bona fide priest. So again, who is this priest? Well, I think the answer is found in that last phrase in verse 35. He shall go in and out before my anointed forever. This priest that God will raise up will be an eternal priest. He will have a ministry that will never end. And friends, every other priest that we meet in the Bible, even the ones that are righteous and good, their priestly ministry always comes to an end because they all eventually die. The only priest that meets the stipulations laid out in this promise from God is the Lord Jesus Christ. Listen carefully to the way the writer of Hebrews describes this in Hebrews chapter 7, verses 23 to 25. The former priests were many in number because they were prevented by death from continuing in office. But he, being Jesus, holds his priesthood permanently because he continues forever. Consequently, he is able to save to the uttermost all who draw near to God through him since he always lives to make intercession for them. Beloved, the priest that is promised in 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 35, is the eternal high priest, Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ is so much more excellent than Hophni and Phinehas and Eli. He is so much better than these ungodly priests. See, Jesus was perfect. He never sinned. He never took advantage of those who were under him. The only thing that he ever took from his people was their sin. He never offered corrupt sacrifices, but instead he offered a perfect sacrifice, not the blood of an animal. He offered his very own life. And because his sacrifice was perfect, because it was accepted by God, he was raised from the dead and sits at the right hand of God the Father and given a name that is above every name. And now as he sits at the right hand of God the Father, he sits down as our eternal high priest. Because of this, he is able to save us to the uttermost. So what does this mean for us as we leave from this place this Lord's Day evening? What does it mean for us? What is the the benefit of the eternal priesthood of Christ when we step into work or, or in our home tomorrow. It means this. That because Christ is your eternal priest, you can be assured that every single one of your sins have been forgiven. There's a lot we can ring out about the, the priesthood of Jesus, but at its heart, because Christ is your eternal high priest, every single one of your sins, past, present, and future, has been forgiven. I mentioned earlier that because Hophni and Phinehas offered corrupt sacrifices, and because of that, God's people couldn't be sure if their sins are for- forgiven, but because Christ is your eternal high priest, you can rest assured that every single one of your sins have been forgiven. And you can possess the, the unique gift of having a peace 
of conscience. Because our God has brought an end to the corrupt priesthood, and in doing so, he has given us an eternal high priest, the Lord Jesus Christ, who even right now is ministering on our behalf. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks and praise for the priestly ministry of Jesus. That we take great comfort in the fact that there is one who is of our flesh and bone, who sits on the throne of heaven and always lives to make intercession for us. So, Lord, we praise you for this and we ask that that truth would sink deeper and deeper into our hearts. We ask that we would leave this place changed based on the word that we have just heard. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Well, friends, let's stand together and receive the Lord's benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace, both now and forevermore. Amen.